Welcome to Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. It's great to see you. How are you all doing today? Good. My name is TJ Hicks. I'm the program coordinator here at the library. And I'm particularly excited about today's program. Um, who has been here to the library before? Most of you, great. Is there anybody, this is your first time? A couple? Great. Well, welcome. Um, I'm excited because one of the reasons that I am here is because my wife uh, works at the Living Desert, and about two years ago, we moved from Illinois here to the desert so she could help take care of the drafts and the rest of their animals there. Uh, and I have seen what an amazing organization they are, the terrific work that they do, uh, and some of the things that they can uh, maybe share with the rest of us that I thought our audience here at the library would love to see as well. So we hope to do more with them in the future, but uh, when this opportunity came up, we said, yes, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's have a, have a lecture, uh, even though we just found out about it about a week ago. Um, so we're thrilled to see you all here. Uh, and like I said, we hope to do more in the future. Uh, just a couple notes. If you haven't already picked up one of our program guides here, this has all of our summer programming. In the summer, most of our programming is geared towards kids with our summer reading program, but we do have adult programs as well. But it's got everything that you could possibly want in here. It's also available online. And then I also want to make sure I point out, you might not have seen it when you came in, but um, the Living Desert has some information in the back. So we'll flip the lights on at the end of uh, today's lecture and make sure you check that out as well. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce the uh, Director of Conservation at the Living Desert, uh, Dr. James Danoffberg. Greetings. Hello. Uh, my name is Dr. James Danoffberg. I'm the Director of Conservation at the Living Desert, as TJ was just saying. And I wanted to continue on what TJ was saying, which is that he is here because the Living Desert was here because his wife took the job with us. Well, we are here because of him, because <laughs> TJ had reached out to us, uh, well, to me, I guess, through, the, through email, and said we would love to be able to partner with you on offering some programs at our library. And we came, gosh, it was, I think it was even just a little over a week ago, had a wonderful discussion, and uh, Guy had just contacted us early last week, and so we said, well, here's a great opportunity. Let's, let's try this partnership out. So we are very happy and very fortunate, and I am very grateful to TJ, uh, and also to Dustin for making things happen up in the booth as well. Um, and our first talk today is the first of what we hope to be a long series of collaborative efforts between the Living Desert and Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. Um, our speaker today, Dr. Guy Western, who will be up here in a moment, leads the Rebuilding the Pride program that is designed to increase lion and other carnivore numbers across the South Rift area of Kenya. Uh, Dr. Western has been leading this program on behalf of the Southern Rift Landowners Association, which is also called Soralo, up on the top right of the page, um, and the African Conservation Center since 2010. It's almost a decade. Um, he grew up in a family of world-leading conservationists, so caring for African species is clearly in his blood, as you may have seen in the photo, and also on his feet, uh, accompanying the notices of this lecture. <laughs> Um, Soralo, who you hear more about shortly, is a visionary conservation organization that works closely with the Maasai and others in southern Kenya to create a healthy and intact landscape that sustains both pastoral communities and wildlife together. It's a really forward-thinking program. Uh, and on a personal note, I was just in Kenya a month ago, uh, and in my role as director of conservation at the Living Desert, I was leading a training workshop with 30 Kenyan uh, conservation leaders. And we were lucky enough to have four Soralo staff members participate in our efforts. And what we were doing in this workshop was trying to build conservation and being able to do social science research, surveys, evaluation, that sort of thing, um, so as to be able to enable them to better understand what the communities who they work with, who live around where they work, what they need, what they want to know, or what they support of the conservation projects, uh, and how they perceive these conservationists. Um, everyone at the workshop was, of course, fantastic, and there were 30 people that we had at the workshop, but I have a very soft spot in my heart for the four wonderful people of Soralo. So it's with great honor and uh, great gratitude that I please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Dr. Western here. Thanks. Jumbo. Jumbo. Right, let's see if we can make this work. It's always a bit awkward because you hear yourself talking at the same time as you're actually talking, which is always slightly peculiar. Um, leading off from what James and TJ said, we are here, well, I am here representing Soralo, and Soralo is here 
because of the great support that Living Desert as a zoo has given to us to do our conservation work over the last couple of years. I've never been to the library itself, but it's pretty amazing by the looks of it and, and very happy to be here. And secondly, thank you to all of you guys for coming out to listen to me. When I come back to Southern California, it always feels a bit like coming home to me, in part because despite my confused accent, I actually do have roots in Southern California. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this, there we go. My, my upbringing itself is about as confused as my accent. My mother is from San Diego. My father is Kenyan by way of Great Britain. I grew up in some of the wildest parts of southern Kenya and had some, a lot of interesting friends. I often make the joke that this is my sister, but I once made that joke with her in the audience. I luckily lived to see the tale. Um, but having grown up in Kenya, I also then had the benefit of coming here to California for my undergraduate degree. I did an environmental studies degree at UC Santa Barbara, just down the road, before going on to do my postgraduate degree in UK at the University of Oxford. So I've really just kind of bounced around the world my whole life. But the story that I'm here to tell you guys is, is not about where I grew up, it's more about where I ended up. And that is an area of Kenya called the South Rift. How many of you guys have been to Kenya? Ah, lots of you guys. I'm guessing most of you probably went to the Mara, yeah? So the Mara itself is right there. How many of you guys went to Amboseli? Nice elephants, Kilimanjaro in the background. Amboseli itself is down there. So two of Kenya's most iconic landscapes, the Mara and Amboseli, and nestled in between them, is this region that we call the South Rift. It, South Rift stands for the South Rift Valley because it's within southern Kenya and it's nestled within the, the Great Rift Valley. The interesting thing about geography is if you're in Kenya, you call it the South Rift, but if you're across the border here in Tanzania, it's the North Rift. <laughs> Perspectives on life can be interesting. So, in particular, I've spent the majority of my time with two Maasai communities in the middle here, in an area called Shampora, Shampola and Okromatian. And the South Rift is, itself is amazing for, for several reasons. One, the landscapes. This is Lake Natron, and the South Rift itself is being considered to be one of the most faulted, so the as Californians, I'm sure you guys are very aware what faults are, but the South Rift itself is one of the most faulted landscapes in the world, and we have these amazing soda lakes, Lake Natron and Lake Magadi, which have been considered by NASA to be some of the most dynamic landforms on Earth. They're constantly changing, there's constant algal blooms, it's absolutely stunning. We've also got a lot of iconic wildlife, lions, elephants, giraffe, Buffalo, and we've got amazing people. The South Rift itself is home to Maasai pastoralists who still live very traditionally, moving seasonally in search of pasture and water. But what is the most amazing, and that's really what I'm here to talk to you guys about today, is that people and wildlife still live together. Unlike a lot of places in the world, Within the South Rift, there is no national park. There's no line in the sand saying, people live here, wildlife live there. Everything coexists, everything lives together, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about coexistence today. The South Rift itself is about the size of Connecticut. It's about 7,000 square miles, so we're talking about a lot of space. But... Across it, as I said, there's not a single national park. So 7,000 square miles, the size of Connecticut, not a single national park, but with people and wildlife living across all 7,000 square miles. 
So what does coexistence mean? Well, I've asked a lot of people this question, and it, it means different things to different people. Some people talk about us coexisting as a species with each other, about political tolerance, about racial tolerance. To some people, it's about living in harmony with nature. I particularly like this one, which was peaceful coexistence between bicyclists and drivers. <laughs> so coexistence clearly means lots of different things to lots of different people. But I think at its base, it's about tolerance. It's about finding a way to share space. And that is going to be one of the themes that we continually circle back to today. Finding space both for people and wildlife, or in some cases, cyclists and drivers. But what does coexistence look like in the South Rift? Well, this is a very good picture of that. We've got a young lioness, and in the background you can see a hut. I, I cheated a little bit when I took this photo. There weren't actually people living in that hut at the time, but it, it serves to show that people and wildlife are, are using the same spaces both seasonally, but often the interaction is actually this close. Sometimes it's peaceful, other times it's less peaceful. <laughs> this is also not someone that's been killed by a lion, but someone fell off their motorbike, cracked their helmet, left it lying around, and lions are really curious creatures. So this young male decided that he'd have a bit of fun and we've got some great photos of him playing with the helmet, but people get a bit worried when they see it the first time. <laughs> so what does coexistence mean to a Maasai? Well, this is a great quote from some of our interviews that we've, we've done with the communities in the South Rift. And this old Musea, this old elder, told us, the Maasai know how to live with lions. We do not need to separate people and wildlife, for we have learned to move around one another. For conservation to succeed, it must maintain this balance between livestock and wildlife. It's a really interesting philosophy. It's a really interesting thought. I, especially in the US, we have a wilderness mentality that a lot of our parks are based on. And it's this notion that actually if we are going to do conservation effectively, we need to take people out of the picture. But suddenly, you're getting quotes like this, where you're like, that's complete opposite of what we usually think of when we think of conservation. It's about pe putting people back into the picture. And one of the amazing things about the South Rift is that communities have coexisted with wildlife. They continue to do so, and they continue to want to do so we did some comparative questionnaire work where we asked communities in the South Rift what they'd like to see happen to the number of lions living within their landscape. Bear in mind, living within their landscape in this sense means living right outside their front door. They're, to them, lions are like domestic cats to you in terms of interaction. Obviously, it's slightly bigger than a domestic cat and can be a lot more dangerous, but when we ask people, do you want to live with lions, it is literally living with lions. And these are the results of the questionnaires. We did them in Hwangi, Zimbabwe, Ruaha, Tanzania, and in Maasailand. And what's amazing in Maasailand is that despite the fact that people are living with these animals every single day, 88% of people that we spoke to wanted to see lion populations in their areas either maintained or increased. That's pretty amazing. Not only do you have communities that have protected wildlife to this point, but they want to continue to do so despite the costs that it might have on them, the risks to their children, so on and so forth, and we'll, we'll talk about that later going forward. Our job as Soralo is to help them do that. The Soralo itself stands for the South Rift Association of Landowners. I'm not very representative of the organization because I'm one of two non-Maasai that works for the organization. I'm essentially technical support, but the organization itself is very similar to a lot of American land trusts in that it's 16 ranches, 16 communities, with about 240,000 people living within them, 
communally that have come together to try and preserve their environment. And Sorolo's job, as I said, is to help them do that. Our vision overall is to maintain a healthy and intact landscape that sustains pastoralist communities and wildlife. Conservation within the South Rift landscape is a challenging thing. We, I only got exposed to this phrase the other day, but I think it encapsulates it quite well. I was, I was told about wicked problems. How many of you guys have ever heard of a wicked problem? Yes. What, what's a wicked problem? James? Exactly. So a wicked problem, the best description I've heard of it is a problem in which there's multiple issues and multiple solutions. So there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. For us, doing conservation and trying to promote coexistence in the South Rift is a wicked problem. But one of the things that we've been able to learn over time is, while there might not be a right way of doing things, there are a couple approaches that work. The first thing that we try and do as an organization is to make sure that people have rights to their land and their resources. Because you, you're going to protect what's yours. And if you don't have rights to what is yours, then there's always going to be a conflict over that resource rather than actual protection of that resource. So governance is one of the pillars of our work. The second pillar is helping people to manage what they do have. Their, their grass, their wildlife, their water reserves. Natural resources, while they can be renewable, are also open to exploitation. And so can we put in place good management systems that ensure natural resources can be maintained and managed sustainably? Finally, thirdly, sorry, people need to be able to make a living off their land and off their resources. So livelihoods is another pillar of the work that we do. And then finally, culture. One of the amazing things about the Maasai as a culture is they are able to coexist with wildlife. Within Maasai culture, hunting of prey, sorry, hunting of zebra and wildebeest, of wild animals is taboo. It's, it's not done. There's only a few circumstances under which you're able to actually go out and hunt wildlife. So, in essence, the culture itself is very geared up to living alongside wildlife. So, maintaining that cultural identity and elements of culture that promote coexistence are extremely important to us as an, as an organization. And I think it's captured best in these two phrases. Does, can anyone pronounce them? Oh, sorry. So, Enkopang roughly translates to our land, our common identity, our pride. It's very similar to patriotism. People love where they're from. The Maasai as communities are extremely proud of their land, their place, their communities. So that is essentially a cornerstone of everything that we do. It's not about protecting someone else's space. It's, it's about protecting your space and your communities. The second word here is very interesting, eremateré. It roughly translates to stewardship over common resources. One of the interesting things in Maasai is that there's not actually a word for conservation. Eremateré is the closest you get, but eremateré is essentially holistic conservation. It's about protecting your family. It's about protecting your livestock. And within Maasai culture, you can't do that if you don't protect the land that you live on and the trees that give shelter and the grass that feeds your livestock and the water that you drink. It's a very holistic picture of conservation itself. So in doing conservation in the South Rift, it starts with setting aside space, protecting what is yours. 
and then it comes down to stewardship. And for Marseille, stewardship is really is about cattle, because Marseille as a culture and as a livelihood is centered around cattle. If you don't have cows, you don't have life. But in order to have cows, as I said, you need water, you need grass. You can't separate one part of the system from another. So one of the things that we work with our constituent communities to try and do, the first thing to do is to actually create space for conservation. Taking those two principles of Enkopang and Aramachere, can we secure space for conservation? But conservation in a slightly different form than it's been practiced traditionally. And that generally starts with meetings under a tree. One of the great things about working in Maasai land is that it's a consensus-based community. So people will sit down and they'll talk about an issue. And only once every single person in that meeting has agreed and is on board with that process can you bring the meeting to a close and can you then carry on. So what it does, it really builds a sense of community ownership in anything that's agreed to because no action is agreed to if there's any voice against that action. So it's a very slow process. Meetings will go on for hours. It would drive Americans crazy. <laughs> what you would get accomplished in a board meeting here in 15 minutes would probably take seven or eight hours in Maasai land. So it takes a lot of patience. But what it allows is a lot of consensus, a lot of buy-in, and a lot of ownership. So earlier I mentioned that the majority of our work has been based in Olkermatin and Champole. These two communities did exactly what we said. They sat under a tree, and they decided that they wanted to set aside a portion of their land as what they called a conservancy. Well, a conservancy is really just a fancy name for a grass bank, an area of your land that's set aside for wildlife, but more important than wildlife, set aside as, as a grass reserve, so that during the dry season, when the grass has been finished elsewhere, you have somewhere to take your livestock. So both communities set up conservancies in the early 2000s, and what that did was it created space for wildlife. These are two maps, and it's a bit hard to see, but everything in orange is what was set aside as the conservancy. Everything in green out here was what was set aside as essentially the permanent settlement area. And then everything up here in beige was the area that was set aside for agriculture. So they zoned their communities, and everything that is the grass bank or the conservancy, there's a local governance committee that decides how and when people can live and settle within that area, and only when grazing has been finished outside of the grass bank, the conservancy, a are people allowed to settle and graze within the conservancy. These black lines here, where you see M1, F1, F2, M2, those are the home ranges of different lion prides within the area. These black dots here are where settlement is in a given month, and then the red dots are where livestock are using. And so this A here, is during the wet season, when people have moved out of the conservancies and they're grazing predominantly outside of the conservancies. This is early dry season. You can see there's some black dots on the east side of, west side of the river here, where people have been allowed to settle and graze within the conservancy. And then this is late dry season, where you see there's a lot more black dots and a lot, of, lot more red dots. So what this shows is that there's a transition. People and wildlife are moving around each other. During the wet season, when all the settlement is in the permanent settlement zone, the lions move right down to this blue line, which is a river. 
as people begin to move back and settle along that river, you can see that the lions shift away. It's almost a dance, if you will. But the most important thing is that people and wildlife are sharing space. They're finding ways to move around each other. And that's what this picture shows. It's not always a pretty picture, though. Doing conservation is hard, as we know from hearing the news. There's a, there's a poaching crisis going on. People want to kill elephants. People want to kill rhinos. Giraffe are very tasty. Sorry, James. <laughs> but a lot of wildlife is actually killed for the illegal markets, but also for, for bushmeat. So as part of this effort, the communities themselves have undertaken to protect wildlife. They've appointed and trained their own wildlife rangers. These are sons and daughters from the communities that are protecting wildlife that are, have been trained, like a lot of government rangers, in wildlife protection. But because they grew up in these areas, they know, they know the landscape like the back of their hands. But most importantly, you're not living in a national park. You're living in a community area. It's essentially ha like having a giant neighborhood watch. And the community game scouts are able to tap into that. But they've got a massive task. As I said, across 7,000 square miles, we've got wildlife, we've got people, and at the moment, we've only got 33 community game rangers that are helping to protect wildlife across that. And there's a lot of wildlife to protect. We have lions. One of the amazing stories that we like to tell is when the communities set up the conservancies in the early 2000s, Maasai traditionally hunt lions as part of their initiation ceremonies to become a man. But the communities themselves said, from this day forward, we're not going to hunt lions. We're going to protect them. The lion numbers in the area have grown from, there was probably two prides of maybe five to 10 lions in the area in 2000. Now, our best guess is there's close to 70. So the lion populations have really, really rebounded. We also have elephants. This picture was actually taken two weeks ago. I was lucky enough to get to go up in a helicopter. But when I started working in this area 10 years ago, I hardly saw an elephant. You speak to my boss, John Kamanga, who grew up in this area and sadly wasn't able to make it today, but he never saw an elephant growing up. We got to go up in this helicopter because we got a phone call from one of the pilots that was flying over to say, we've just seen a herd of 300 elephants. So that was pretty incredible. And if you actually even just look in every little corner, there's, there's an elephant poking out. So, and lots of little babies scattered around. So an incredible success story. You know, the fact that we're suddenly we're getting herds of 300 elephant. It was probably the highlight of my year, if not my decade. We also have a lot of giraffe. I know a lot of focus has recently been put on the plight of giraffe, but we're lucky in the South Rift that we still have big herds. The biggest, the biggest group of giraffe that I've counted, actually it's technically called a tower if they're standing, or a journey if they're walking, but the biggest journey of giraffe that I've seen in the South Rift was 110 wow. in one group. So, so pretty amazing. And this, this is the side of conservation that people are probably most familiar with. The notion of we have wildlife, we have rangers, we need to keep wildlife safe from people. Because that's what people are used to. You have a national park, you need to protect the national park and the wildlife in it. The side of conservation that is our biggest issue that people often are unaware of is keeping livestock and people safe. We're not in a national park. As I said earlier, there's no invisible line saying wildlife stay there, people stay there. 
You have elephants, you have lions, you have very, very dangerous creatures roaming around at all times, and that's, that's really risky. I put this photo up to give you an idea of how big a lion actually is. So that's my hand. I have fairly decently large hands, but a male lion is upwards of 250 kilos, so 500 plus pounds. That's sheer muscle. So you can imagine the kind of damage that a pool that size can have, even if it just playfully slaps you across the face. Lions also like steak, as we've discovered. So it's not just about keeping people safe, but this is, this is a herder who had lost his livestock to lions. And as I said, lions themselves do like to eat livestock, but livestock within Maasai culture is not just your wallet, it's, it's the centerpiece of your identity. It's, it's what your culture is based on. They know each individual by name. They love every single animal. It's much more similar to the relationship that we have with our pets. So you're not, you're not just losing one of your cows. You're losing possibly one of your favorite animals, you know, an animal that you've brought up from when it was a calf to when it was an adult. So it's a, it's a very real loss. So one of the things that we try and do, as I said, is to keep people and livestock safe. One of the easiest ways to do that is when livestock does get lost, to rescue them. That can take various different forms. This is my Ridgeback when he was a puppy, and a little she a sheep that we rescued and were able to return home. We don't always have the right equipment. This was, <laughs> this was a cow in our Jeep. And it was left out overnight and luckily survived the first night. And then we found it on the second evening and wanted to try and return it to its owner. I will say that Maasai are amazing herders. They do everything in their power to look after their livestock. But the South Rift is hot. Imagine Palm Desert in July for 12 months a year. And then imagine that you are out herding with your livestock in that heat for 12 hours a day. No matter how good of a herder you are, you're going to lose livestock at some point. So we try and save them when they do. One of the things that we learned very quickly is where there's a will, there's a way. Probably not the most comfortable for the cow, but given the alternative. <laughs> science also comes into the picture. We, we use GPS technology and satellite trackers to try and understand where lions are spending time so that we can give that information back to local herders and livestock owners in the area so that they can plan their grazing around that. One of the things I've learned about farmers across the world, whether you're in Kenya or in the US, they don't like being told what to do. So we don't tell them what to do, we simply provide information and let them make their own decisions. One of the common questions we get about GPS collars is, do the lions ever try and get them off? Well, they don't, but they make for quite a fun toy for the cubs sometimes. But as I said, it's not just livestock that's at risk. People are at risk. And this is a photo of a herder that was attacked by hyenas trying to defend his livestock. But this is Joshua, who's one of our community game rangers. And we provided Joshua with medical training on bleeding control and how to deal with traumas. And this was actually an amazing story because it just so happened that it was one of those days that everything went right and our car was at its base. This incident occurred a mile from where our base was. Josh was in camp, but we were able to attend the incident, get the herder to hospital, 
and actually he was very, very badly wounded on his arms, but the doctors at the hospital reckoned that if it hadn't been for Joshua's training and his cool head and his use of tourniquets, that the herder probably would have had to have at least one of his arms amputated. So an amazing story, and our rangers are actually doing an amazing job on the ground as well. Another part of what we do is about strengthening traditional governance. And so this is Joshua here again with the local conservation committee. As I said, there's already a very good foundation of traditional governance around natural resources. We're not trying to undermine that. What we're trying to do is strengthen that. And we do, we do a lot of learning exchanges to other communities. What we found is that peer-to-peer -peer learning is often the best way. We have taken community members and our rangers to visit other projects around Kenya. But amazingly, we've also had other projects from around the world coming to visit us. We've had ranchers from New Mexico. We've had pastoralists from Tibet. And it's amazing when you actually get these two groups together because the cultures are so different. But when they start talking about livestock and cows and the threats to their livelihoods and their families, they all say the same thing. Your story is our story. And so it's been an extremely powerful way of actually promoting conservation is this, this sharing across communities that are facing similar challenges. This is another great quote about understanding the importance of traditional governance. Even as an old man, I know where lions, leopards, and all manner of wildlife can be found. When my livestock go to pasture, I go ahead to survey the area to ensure that there is nothing that will bring them harm. If I find lion tracks, I show them to my children in order to teach them the areas that are dangerous for livestock. It seems very simple when you think about it. But it's these foundations of traditional knowledge that we really, really need to maintain and maintain that connection to, the, to your area, to your livelihood, to your culture, because once that's lost, then coexistence disappears. I love this photo because we now actually have student groups as well that come from the US, Europe, to learn about conservation from the communities that we're working with. So it gives all of our leaders a real kick, because here they are standing up giving lectures to university students, and they don't even know how to read or write. But it's, it has been an amazing story. And so as we kind of begin to draw to a close, the question is, well, where is all of this leading? And the whole notion of rebuilding the pride itself is exactly that. It's everything that we've been talking about so far. It's this notion of enkopang, eramatere, this, this notion of traditional knowledge. What we're trying to get to is a point that actually we don't need to generate conservation solutions from outside. We have the majority of answers within the communities we work with. Our communities generally already want to protect wildlife. And what we're trying to do is find more effective ways to help them do what they're already doing, not reinvent the wheel. So this is a map of the Suralo landscape in a bit more detail. We were talking about Shampolo or Kermati in here. We also have other active conservancies up in Suswa. We have three conservancies that are being developed, four actually, Narosara, this is Oldonyo Nyoki, Meto, Mailoa. And then we have a handful, about five others, that we want to begin to develop. And these are communities that are coming to us as an organization saying, can you help us? We have wildlife. We want to protect it. But we don't have the resources or the technical capacity to do it. Our answer to them is very simple you do have the technical capacity to do it. You just need to keep doing what you've been doing. Resources, we don't have the resources to help you either. Conservation is inherently fraught 
as an industry and that you spend your whole life begging for money. But we can try and get you the resources. And so really that's where we're going is these are four new game scouts that we've been able to hire in the last month to man one of our new conservancies. But if we want to achieve our vision of keeping the South Rift intact, healthy, connected, we really need to scale up what we're doing. We really need to be helping all of these communities that want help to conserve their wildlife. The great news is coexistence, as I said before, is about tolerance. It's about collaboration. It's about working together. We're working with communities that want to do the right thing. They just need a little help in doing that. And that's where partnerships come in. The, the zoo itself, our other donors, have been really, really supportive. You know, without those kind of partnerships, we wouldn't be able to do what we do as an organization. And partnerships aren't just about money. There's a huge amount of technical capacity that zoos and other organizations in the US bring to the work that we do. Everything from marketing to helping us understand how to do education programs more effectively, really everything under the sun. So I think in closing, I'd really like to say a huge thank you to all of you guys for listening to me. And an even bigger thank you to the zoo and Roger Snowball in particular, who's been a long-term supporter of, of Serralo and the work that we do. If you guys do want to support, we have an affiliated organization, ACC, that's a 501c3 in the US. The information's up here, and there's a couple leaflets at the back that you guys could, could pick up as well. So with that, you spend a lot of time listening to me. I'd love to spend a bit of time listening to you guys. If you guys have any questions, thoughts, ideas, we're always, always open to them. Thank you. In, in the um, conservation dialogue under the tree, were women present? Were women present under the tree? Not under that particular tree. <laughs> the interesting thing about Maasai society is that it's still very patriarchal. And men are seen to run the show. But actually, like the world over, behind every strong man, there's an even stronger woman. So, so women aren't often involved in a lot of these decisions, but they're pulling the strings behind the scenes. And one of the nice stories that we do have is where all of this work is based is a center in Champola called the, the Le Lenoc Resource Center. And when all of this conservation work was being set up, the women did exactly what you did. They put up their hand and they said, hold on, men own livestock, they own the land, they're going to be in charge of the tourism enterprises. What, what can we do? And John Kamanga, my boss, thought about it and said, you know what? We've got all these funny researchers that are coming and we've got these student groups, and they don't pay much money because they're students, but you know what? Why don't we build a center for all of this conservation work that will be a research hub, and it will be a resource center and a community center? And that's what you can have as the women. And the women were like, yes, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll take that. And the rest of the men in the community were like, ah, that's a stupid idea. It's never going to work. It's never going to work. So there was no objection. Anyway, <laughs> 10 years later, we have a beautiful resource center that's owned by the women. Every single student that comes through there, every single researcher that comes through there pays a fee to stay there, which goes directly to the women. And you know what they did with it, with all that money? They didn't go into their pockets. They've taken that money, and they've chosen the neediest girls within the community 
and they're paying their school fees for them to go through school. So it definitely shows that women are better at managing money than men. Yes? In your presentation, you mentioned the housing, and they have one house during one season, and they move to another house during the other season. Are these homes permanently owned by each family, or how does that work? It's a really good question. So, in essence, a homestead is owned by a particular family. It will be known as, they're known as Nkangs in Maasai, so that you'll know that's um, so-and-so's Nkang or that's so-and-so's Nkang. But use of them is not necessarily designated just for that family. So anyone can use them, as long as you ask permission from the owner. So exactly as you said, people will have three or four Nkangs dotted around their community that they use at different times of year. But if someone wants to use them, they're welcome to use that space. Even if they're living there, it's about accommodating space. There, there really is such a strong sense of community in the communities they work with, and people do bond together and help get each other through hard times. Yes. I was wondering if you're doing any work with the wildlife, the smaller ones, like the flamingos that I had heard were really declining at Lake Nuk and Kuru. Is there any work being done with animals like that? Yeah, so Lake Nakuru in particular is further north than, than the area that we work in. But we treat species like elephants and lions as an umbrella species. So because they cover such a large area and are dependent on having healthy ecosystems, we believe that if you can protect elephants and lions, that you're also protecting the habitats and all the manner of small species that exist within those habitats as well. So we essentially use elephants and lions as an umbrella species for protecting all manner of biodiversity within that. Yeah. Hello. Uh, any discussion to, to ecotourism? Because as you know, the conservancies in the Masai Mara seem to be doing well with that. Yeah, so it's a great question. So one of the things that I didn't mention is that there are two ecotourist lodges that have been set up in the area. And the tourists, like in the Mara, pay a fee to stay there. A portion of that fee goes back to the community to help them with their wildlife protection efforts. But what we find is that no matter how big your wildlife industry is in these areas, it's never going to equal the amount of livelihood and the amount of income that's brought in by cattle. So for us, it all starts with grass. It's about protecting your rangeland. And if you can protect your rangeland, then you can have healthy livestock, but you can also have healthy wildlife. Hi. Um, can you give some examples of how the families work to really protect their, their families themselves, their children, and or their livestock from you know, seemingly predators like lions? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So one of the main things that people do with especially livestock. Livestock is never left out to wander by itself. It's always actively herded and generally where possible if livestock are having to graze in dangerous areas, herders are never sent out alone and they're never sent out. Small kids are usually only left to look after young sheep and goat that stay close to the homesteads. If you're going to dangerous areas with your livestock then it's generally men and more experienced herders that are sent with the livestock. And also, in terms of the setup of the homestead itself, you have a, a thorn fence which is constructed around all the houses, and then within those houses, you actually have livestock in a corral surrounded by the houses and then surrounded by the thorn fence. So those are the two main avenues used for protecting wildlife. Sorry, protecting livestock. Uh, 
does the community use all of the livestock themselves? And if not, how, what, how do they market the rest of it? So as the crow flies, we are only about 100 or so miles from Nairobi. So there's a massive livestock market in Nairobi. And there's smaller markets within the community. So a lot of livestock is sold to the market for, for resale in Nairobi. But Maasai don't actually like to sell their livestock. It's a cattle accumulating society. Their status is in owning livestock, not in selling it. So people generally will only sell when they have to, and unfortunately will only sell usually when prices, prices are lowest because livestock are in the worst condition. They'll hold on to them for as long as possible. So these are the, some of the kind of things that we're trying to do from a livelihoods perspective is can we do a few market-based literacy programs to actually say, think about when you sell, how you sell, you can make a bit more money. You don't have to change what you do substantially, but if you know that school fees are due in a month and everyone's going to be selling their livestock in a month and prices are going to drop, can you sell your livestock two weeks before that when market prices are still, still high? Yes. I don't know the history of Kenya. Is it a colony? And if so, is the land communally owned? Or have there, there been uh, legal fictions that impose land ownership that would result in some exploitation by an individual landowner? That's, that's a great question. Kenya is a former British colony. And land in Kenya is actually one of the most emotive issues. The majority of the communities that we work with are, are consist, consist of ranches that are anywhere between 500 and 2,000 square miles. But that ranch itself is held as a communal title rather than a private title. So it's essentially almost a shareholding agreement within the community itself. But one of the biggest threats that we face is that both the government and land barons essentially are trying to buy up large tracts of rangeland to, to either develop them or as parts of land prospecting. As I said, we're close to Nairobi. So people are trying to imagine where the next satellite town for Nairobi, which is the Kenya capital, is going to be and buy land there. So actually maintaining rights to your land is, is the foundation of everything that we try and do as an organization to ensure that the communities we work with actually do have fair and equitable rights to the land that they're entitled to. Yeah, James. You had shown that great slide with uh, the three parks, one in uh, Tanzania, one in Zimbabwe, and then the South Rift, in terms of receptivity to uh, lion populations and whether they should increase or decrease. Could you explain why in the first two the first one was, was quite resistant to continued change, like in Huangay in, in Zimbabwe, uh, whereas Ruaha and, and Maasai land are much more receptive to either maintaining or increasing. Great, great question. One of the things that we found was that actually attitudes towards lion conservation was very context specific. When we interrogated those questions in the manner that you're asking, what we found in Zimbabwe was that actually people didn't see any benefit from lions. Even though they had lions living on their land, they had no direct benefit that was coming to them. That was the first thing. The second thing is Zimbabwe as a country over the last two decades economically has collapsed. And what that has done is it created a real fear in people that they might lose whatever assets they have. So if you have livestock, actually losing that livestock is a much, much bigger threat if you're living in Zimbabwe than if you're living in Kenya. Because if you lose your cow in Zimbabwe, what are you going to do? There's, there's no other form of economic activity that you can do. You're either a farmer or you're a livestock owner. That's your main livelihood. So the economic situation in Zimbabwe actually played a huge effect on making people 
more, I guess, aware or afraid of losing their livestock to lions. So lions were hated that much more because it was seen as a major threat to your livelihood. In Tanzania, it was a very interesting case because Tanzanian law is such that the government owns all wildlife. And it's been a very state-centric approach to wildlife management. So people don't, firstly, don't see the benefits from wildlife they do in Kenya. But secondly, it's, it's seen as something that belongs to the government. So the example that I like to give is, I'm sure that a lot of us in this room have cats. A lot of us probably have dogs as well. If you came home and you walked in your front door and you found that the neighbor's dog had somehow gone into your house and eaten your cat, you'd be pretty angry with your neighbor, wouldn't you? Might be a few fists thrown. However, if you came home and you opened the door and your dog had killed your cat, your reaction would be completely different. That, that sense of ownership really does affect how people see issues. So in Tanzania, because lions and wildlife are seen as a government issue, it's something that the government should protect, not you as a community. Could you speak a little bit to how children may directly or indirectly be learning from this work? Yeah. So one of the programs, again, we've sorry, given a really short overview of everything we do. It's, it's very hard to encapsulate it all into a 40-minute talk. But we do have an education outreach program where we work with local wildlife clubs at schools and teach them a lot about the work we do. But the majority of what we're trying to do with them is actually just re-engage them with traditional knowledge. So rather than us actually being the teachers, we've worked with local elders in the area to come up with a traditional um, knowledge curriculum, essentially. So teaching them again about their culture, about rather than teaching them what a lion is and its Latin name, they're taught about the Maasai name for it and, and folk tales and myths around lions in Maasai culture. So that's, that's one way. Another way actually is directly through the people that we employ as an organization. As an organization, we employ close to 70 people now. And one of the things that each one of our employees cares most about is their families. And so they go home to their kids and talk about what they do and the work that they do. And it's amazing now we actually have children of some of the people that work for us coming saying, hey, I've, I've just finished my high school diploma. Can we come intern for you? Can we come work for you? So there's that, that trickle-down effect. But uh, as I said, with, with a lot of the communities that we're working with, they, they really do care about wildlife inherently, and that, that culture is transmitted from one generation to the next. There was a great quote that came from one of the elders when I was sitting talking to him, and saying, you know, these, these lions, why do you want them here? You know, why do you want zebra here? Zebra eat all your grass. And he was like, you know, if I go somewhere and I don't see wildlife, I don't like that place. <laughs> because I ask myself, what is wrong with that place that there's no wildlife there? There must be something so wrong with that place that there's not even, not even wildlife want to go there. <laughs> so why should I take my cows there? So it's just a completely different mindset and way of thinking. Yes. There is there is an increasing fear, especially as people become more sedentary. And so what we see is there's a, ten, a tendency that communities that interact with lions on an everyday basis aren't scared of them. But communities that don't interact with lions and you suddenly probably maybe have a lion moving through for the first time in five years are very, very afraid. So there's a huge spectrum. But 
It is amazing. I always laugh about it because when we go out tracking, all the guys in the rangers are out ahead and they're on foot and you're like, you're following a lion. It's just there. And they're like, ah, oh, no, the lion's fine. Next thing they see a snake track and they're back in the Jeep in, in a second. <laughs> so so fear, is, fear is very relative. Um. All right, so I think we'll probably wrap up, but uh, can you just join me in uh, thanking the Living Desert and Dr. Western for this amazing talk.